Hello there, sword friends. Today I'm going to do a sword log vlog blog type thing about why sword reviews suck and why they're hard to make and why you shouldn't trust them and at least some of that. I'm personally very interested in that topic. I'm always interested in making sword reviews better or at least why people do or don't trust them or, or just generally thinking about sword reviews. And I thought the topic might be interesting to those of you that consume sword reviews, namely the people that watch this channel. Uh, anyway, my brain has been noodling on it since I read an article or blog type thing on Cult of Athena. I'll provide a link to the description down below. There are some points on the article which I will address, and I, I'm, I think I've given kind of the top level view of the point of the article, uh, but in any event, I will link it in the description down below so that you can read it in its entirety. I believe it has very valid points and criticisms, and I have, I have some thoughts on them, and I will provide them momentarily, but before I do, there's actually something I'd like to do, and that's give a special thanks to the 5,000 of you that have elected to subscribe to this channel. I don't honestly know a ton about YouTube metrics and how sharing and liking and subscribing and all that stuff work, but it's it's pretty clear that it helps. So thank you. Thank you for subscribing to the channel. Thank you to everyone that's liked and shared and engaged with the content. Uh, I know I've had a lot of good conversation in the comment section. I've had good, uh, good conversations and feedback from people that have reached out to me via email or Facebook. I've had a lot of uh, positive interactions with folks that have watched the content and it's it's meant a great deal. Even there's been certainly sometimes I would say that I'm at a low point, not feeling like making sword videos, and I've gotten a lot of uh, kind words thrown my way that have really kept me motivated to making more content. So thank you for those of you that have subscribed, and more just people that consume, that watch the videos, that critique them and give me some feedback, or that uh, have interesting conversations spurs from. Even the folks that have nothing but vitriol and mean things to say, I still appreciate that you watched the video and took time out of your day to to throw me that bag of shit. Um, it's, it's still, all in all, people, it's engagement, I suppose, and I appreciate everyone's time that's contributed in some way uh, to, the, to the channel. So thank you. Thank you for the 5,000 subscribers. Thank you for the thousands of you that have sent comments and, and things in the, uh, in the comment section below and that have had, I've said thank you enough. Thank you. Now, this is going to be a very rambly video. I will overlay some pretty pictures so you don't just have to look at my face while I ramble at the camera. But uh, anyway, I'm going to ramble on about this topic now. So the first point in the Cult of Athena uh, blog post was that people review stuff that they've never seen before. And intuition tells me that this is a rampant problem and that it happens a lot. But honestly, when I went to go find an example, I, I really couldn't. I went to Amazon, the largest retailer online, and Honestly, there weren't a ton of reviews to, to examine. So I went to swords that I had reviewed to see if the feedback was wildly different than things that I had, or what I had critiqued in my review, or if it, the, the star rating would be different. Honestly, it seemed pretty close. I mean, I, I know people have different perspectives on things, but all of the purchases seemed to be verified, so assumably somebody from that account bought the item, and, and the feedback seemed to be within, within reason. Some of it was short, but anyway, um, I don't know that, that I can find a lot of examples. I suppose the main thing is that you just want to be wary of, of star, you know, like these small star purchase type things where it says this one's a five star, one star, and how many is that based on? It's a simple metric, but this could certainly play into it where people are contributing to that star rating and it, it doesn't necessarily mean much. Though, again, I couldn't find a lot of examples of it happening, though, again, it, intuition tells me it certainly does. Now, if we're considering first-hand experience more valuable, one thing that you could do is look at the Sword Fires Guide review section. That's that's one place that I used to contribute a little bit more. But you can find people that have posted personal photos. That's usually an indicator that there's first-hand experience, or that they're they're giving you, you know, from first-hand experience knowledge because they're they're able to take a photo of the product itself. Uh, and there's also obviously YouTube. You can see a schlub like me swinging a sword around. So regardless of if you value the, the critique or not, it comes from first-hand experience. Which you might want to look out for are people that are placing reviews and then only providing photos or uh, information that really you could get just about anywhere. And a lot of times that's something like, the, the article really sums it up. It's kind of like a Facebook thumbs up or thumbs down. You like the aesthetics, you like it, or you don't. But I, honestly, I, I didn't see a whole lot of that. So at least where I could, I could find something that was a review, I didn't see that it was rampant, but... I don't know, for some reason it certainly seems like it is. If you can provide an example or, or see, or tell me where you're looking to find these star information bits that are, are skewing perspective, I'd be interested to see where they are and how, how it all plays in the market. Anyway, not something I was really able to provide an example of. The second point is some people have an agenda, and this is, this is a tricky one because 
uh, it's tough to say what's in somebody's heart and, and what's on their mind and what their motivations are. Some people are great at reading that in people. I am certainly not. Anyway, the point is I don't, I don't claim to know what somebody's personal motivations are. It's certainly possible that somebody is intentionally trying to mislead you or has, has an agenda to see a company uh, fail. I know there are plenty of people that don't like a particular company or a, a particular owner of a company and would really like to see them suffer and fail and their business to go under and sometimes it has very little to do with the products and sometimes it has everything to do with the products but there are, there are certainly times where people I would say have an agenda or a very biased opinion though bias I suppose is the is the next bit of this and one thing that was listed is that um, you're assuming that reviewers are unbiased this was a note in the article that there's there's some assumption that a review is unbiased and that's it I don't know per, to me that sounds impossible everyone is biased in one way shape or form uh, as an example some of the things listed in the article where you get a free review sample so you feel obligated to give that uh, that company a positive review because you've received free stuff and there's a there's a sense of obligation to be nice to somebody that provided you with free goods vice versa i've heard it said that when you buy your buy something with your own money you're more inclined to review it positively because you want to justify to yourself that that was a wise choice and that money was well invested and that you're not a stupid idiot for spending a bunch of money on something. So it seems like there's there's an argument to be had either way, regardless if you get something for free or if you pay for it with your own money. Um, I don't know that you can really escape bias as much as you can just acknowledge that it's there and what biases may exist so that the consumer of the content can make their own judgment. Anyway, I think biases exist in, in just about every every possible scenario, whether it be you're personally invested in a company and you want to see them succeed at the expense of others, or you have a reputation or, or relationship with a company that you just want to see do well, or maybe one that you, you want to see fail. Um, there are certainly situations where somebody has an agenda and it's a very intentional thing that they're misleading people and they know they're, they're saying false information or they're, they know they're, they're not necessarily being 100% truthful. And there's other folks that are, are speaking their, their what they believe is true and, and just they have some sense of bias. It's tough to say what that is, but it's always a good idea, I suppose, to keep in mind what does a person have to gain or lose by providing the information that they're giving you. Um, if you know the reviewer, if you've read their content, their blogs, you've consumed their videos, you've uh, interacted with them before and you understand something about their experience or their perspective, then hopefully that makes the, the material easier to consume and more worthwhile. But anyway, it's, it's certainly a tough one. I think it's, it's just safe to say stay skeptical, take things with a grain of salt and trust but verify. The third point is that there are not enough reviews to get an accurate picture. And while I believe this is true, it's also partially not relevant. And if I can elaborate, I don't personally think there's any number of reviews that you'd be able to get, whether it's one or 1,000 reviews out there on a product. I don't know that there's anything that you're going to be able to do to escape the reality that holding a sword is really the only way to get a really solid idea of if it's for you or not. Um, you might grow in or, or grow to love a sword, certainly, but there's really no substitution for holding something in your hand. And one review, regardless of how diligent and technical and thorough, or regardless of how many of those diligent, technical, perfect, thorough reviews there are, there's just not, not a substitute. I can't say with 100% certainty that every person after reading very competent thorough reviews would not have any surprises when they when they held a sword in their hand. Um, there's just, it's in a, it's in a substitute. Now, on, on the other hand, um, I know there are situations where there are just not a lot of reviews. One of the reasons I thought I could contribute to YouTube in a meaningful way is because that was the case. I went to go uh, research a sword myself and there was one review or one bit of information, not even a review on YouTube about it, and I. I didn't end up really liking the product and I thought maybe there's something I can contribute here. I, I don't have any particular level of expertise in any field, but I've handled a lot of stuff and I can work a camera reasonably, so maybe there, there's some information I could add that would be useful to people. Uh, nevertheless, there are certainly not a lot of reviews on a lot of these products and it's, it's tough when that's the case because unfortunately a review is often the closest thing people will be able to get to holding it before they invest a substantial amount of money in a product that, uh, that they have a, a good chance of not liking or that it, it might not fit them. Um, anyway, the, the main point is, and, and what kind of rattles around in my brain a little bit, is I don't know what number of reviews, reviews would be the right number to say, that's enough. And I, it seems like even in the swords like the Practical Plus, which has lots of reviews out there, it's a well-documented good sword for, for beginners. It has a good reputation. I don't know how many 
how many reviews would prepare you to say, I'm, I'm, I know exactly how that sword is going to feel in my hand and it's the perfect choice for me, or not? I, I, I can't say what number that would be. Anyway, maybe I'm just a little too in the weeds, hard to see the forest through the trees type situation, but uh, anyway, certainly can agree there are not enough reviews to provide a holistic perspective on many of these products. The fourth point is probably the most kind of on the nose, and that is that some people have no idea what they're talking about. And this is true, certainly. I, I don't know that I have a whole lot of argument to give here. Yes, there are certainly people that don't know what they are talking about, and more importantly, that perpetuate kind of false information and represent themselves as experts when they, they don't necessarily have any expertise to, to really share. Um, honestly, though, I think the internet does a pretty good job of weeding those people out, or at least identifying them, and, and you can find a lot of response videos, a lot of angry comments, and uh, and usually somebody will chime in and try and help, and there's, anyway, those people usually get identified, but there are people as well that know enough to be dangerous, and some that are experts in one thing, but not, you know, everything, and there are people that represent themselves as experts and know very little, but there's people that represent themselves as knowing very little and get interpreted as experts anyway. The internet is a very strange place at times. The good thing is that swords are a pretty mature hobby in the realm of collecting and using uh, a lot of martial arts that use swords are historic pieces that are, are well documented so you can often verify or substantiate what what claims are being made it takes a little bit of research and some gumption for sure but it's a, the benefit of this kind of very mature hobby is that the things that are rooted in, in facts that we can that we have and that are well documented are available and just are a page turn away I suppose. One thing that the internet is good at as I noted is calling out people that perpetuate false information and put themselves on pedestals as experts they, they kind of quickly get identified but the internet is not so great at calling out people that are experts in one topic but just not in everything. Uh, very often I'll see people that are experts in martial arts called out for misquoting some some element of history. There's a lot of different things that go into a sword and a lot of different reasons that people buy them. Don't assume that the reason that you would want a sword is the reason somebody else would. There's a lot of different kind of buyers in the in the overall realm of things and not everyone can be an expert in everything. I think the internet does kind of a bad job at at saying, hey, you're dumb, you've misquoted this thing, so you don't know anything. And very often I see experts in a particular category ridiculed for some misquote or, or overstepping their expertise in a particular category when they certainly have a lot of expertise and, and uh, knowledge to contribute to the community, just, just don't have time to, to battle keyboard ninjas, I guess. No reviewer is going to know everything. It's tough to be an expert in anything any one of those categories I mentioned, let alone multiple. So uh, it's it's one of the downsides. But the, the thing is that there are a lot of valuable experts out there that can contribute and a lot of information that you can use to substantiate those experts as well. It's tough to find, but certainly doable. One other point that was mentioned in the article is that the reviewer has seen good products you know, get very poor scores and very good products receive very low scores or very low bad products. You get what I'm saying, the opposite of what you would think it should be. And one thing that comes to mind that I would probably add here is just variation. And this is also a challenge of, of sword reviews as well, but the point is that there's there's a lot of variation in the mass production realm of swords. Swords just basically they are to some extent some sort of handmade object and our assumption as consumers is that if I buy a a sword of this particular model and manufacturer that they're all the same and they're they're not there's a pretty wide swing in terms of length and balance and dynamic properties I have for example a Hanwei bamboo mat that I really really like and I've had many others trying in an effort to replace that sword for when I inevitably break it accidentally the point is that in the in the time I've tried to replace it, I haven't been able to. The sword that I have is like eight to nine ounces heavier in its bare blade format than many of the the other swords. It's got a pretty wide. It's it's basically heavier than many of the other swords out there. And even though I bought other Hanwei bamboo mats, they just they have different sword, different length, different dynamic properties, and they feel like different blades. So I, I've hunted for this this sword that I've I've tried to find a duplicate of under that same assumption that. The Hanwei Bamboo Mat is the Hanwei Bamboo Mat, and they're all going to be really close to, to each other, and, and they haven't been. Um, mine seems to be, in fairness, one of the, the far outliers. It seems to be more the, 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 on the wide end of, of that uh, distribution, if you will. But the point is uh, that when we're talking about mass-produced swords, there's a lot of variation in the swords. So as a reviewer, if I say 
this sword is has these dynamic properties and I really like how this moves or that moves. There's no guarantee that if you buy the exact same sword by the same manufacturer, even within the same time period, that it's going to feel the same. And that variation is not something that inherently registers and may be the source of why you see a product that's a, you think, oh man, this is, this is a fantastic sword. And the next reviewer says, I don't know, I thought it was a clumsy mess. But you, you may be reviewing, in fact, two completely different feeling objects. Now, obviously, that is more applicable to mass production swords, which I think is the, the kind of bread and butter of where many of these sword reviews come from. In the realm of custom swords, a sword review doesn't necessarily provide you with any information because it's assumed that your, your custom sword is probably going to be one of a kind. If you have a well-regarded smith make you a sword and then you get it all fitted up with, with one-of-a-kind fittings, it's really a one-of-a-kind object. And the reviews do more to, to kind of direct you in how, a, how that smith performs and your experience in working with them and some of what they're capable of manufacturing. That's, that's what the review does, but you're not necessarily expecting the sword you get from them to be the exact same as the one in the review. But I, I think that's a fair assumption that many people do assume that's the case with swords that are, are mass-produced. And the manufacturing tolerances are just not, not what you would expect. More specifically, a sword is just very sensitive in that way. Something that has an extra ounce of steel at the tip or where the, the distal taper or the grind lines are a little different, where the distribution of, of a sword just basically you're, you're sensitive to it even if you're not a very competent swordsman. I would say that if you have two swords that are the same weight and same length, but the point of balance is uh, an inch further up or an inch further back, that even if you're not a skilled swordsman, you'll feel a difference in, in the sword even though the point of balance only varies by an inch. Likewise, if you have swords the, the same length and you know the, the same, you know pretty much everything else, but one is an ounce lighter, you'll probably notice that ounce, particularly if it's you know, somewhere else. If the point of balance even on those two swords is the same, but one's, one's an ounce or so lighter, you'll, you'll probably notice that. Now, whether or not that makes a tangible difference and whether or not you're willing to pay more or less, I, I can't say that. But I would say that even as an unskilled practitioner or somebody swinging a sword around, you'll hold the two objects in your hand and say, I feel the difference. And you'll likely be able to say which one you prefer. If you're assuming that these two objects cost the same amount of money and, and really should be the same thing, that's an unfortunate consequence of the variation we see in mass production. Sources. Anyway, those are most of the points I have. I think it really boils down to there's no substitute for holding a sword and I'm not you as much as I try to be empathetic or knowledgeable or, or provide some level of expertise and exacting information, I'm, I'm not going to be you and I don't know what your tastes are and I don't know what you're going to like because I'm just a random guy on the internet. So. Um, hopefully you have a healthy sense of skepticism as you listen to me or any other reviewer. Hopefully this provided you with some extra information. But now I would say I'm more interested in hearing your thoughts. Is there anything uh, you think I missed about reasons that you maybe wouldn't trust a sword review or some idea about how to make sword reviews more trustworthy? What should be included? Or maybe you're a sword reviewer, you've done reviews yourself and found some challenges. Is there anything that you think is uniquely different or hard or challenging about sword reviews? Be interested to hear your thoughts on all those all those types of topics. Throw them in the commentary down below, and uh, and that's all I got. As always, cheers and thanks for watching.